So physics is perhaps the most fundamental of all the sciences. And the main purpose of physics is to understand the interrelationship between various quantities. In particular, we want to know how matter, space, energy, and time all interact with each other. And our main avenue for understanding this is going to be to make measurements. In physics, our measurements are going to be key because we want to use these measurements to get numbers. Physics is a very numerical or quantitative science. We want to do numbers, we want to do algebra, we might even want to do calculus to figure out how matter, space, energy, and time all interact with each other. So if we're going to take measurements, we need to be familiar with a certain quantity in measurement, measuring called units. Units basically tell you what kind of measurement tool you're actually using. This is the tool that you, determined by the tool that you use to measure. So how does this work in practice, and what kind of units are we talking about? Well, there's only three big ones that we need to know in physics to start off with. The three big ones, we need to measure lengths, so how big something is. And we can measure a length in the units of meters. So we might use a long stick, something called a meter stick, to measure lengths. We also need to be able to measure times. We need to measure how long things take to happen. So for time, our major unit is going to be the second. And then we also need to measure mass, how big something is, how much material something is made out of, how much matter is in an object. And we're going to want to usually use the units called kilograms. And combined, these three units are different aspects of a system called the System Internationale. These are standardized units that are used sci by scientists all over the world. So by using these units, these three, we can collaborate with scientists in other places in the world, and they will know what we're talking about. Now, even though we might always try to use the SI system, sometimes that's not always appropriate. So we need to do some unit conversions. We need to be able to flip between units. There are two different types of conversions that we'll want to do. We might want to do simple metric conversions. So I think of these as converting by factors of 10. So maybe I've measured something in uh, some kind of unit like maybe millimeters or centimeters. So maybe I've measured 100 centimeters. I want to convert that into just meters so that it's in the international system. I would convert that by moving the decimal place over 2 to get to meters. These factors of 10 conversions are something you should be familiar with from prior classes, from prior work. Uh, if you need help with these, then you, you, need to, you need to let me know. The other kind of unit conversions we need to do involve using dimensional analysis. So this might use conversion factors, so certain aspects of units uh, where we've measured how many feet are in a mile, so we can convert between uh, different, wholly different measurement approaches. So let's see an example or two of dimensional analysis. So let's say I want to do a simple metric conversion. I want to do something like how many millimeters are there in one kilometer? So I want to convert one kilometer into millimeters. So I can use a process called the factor label process. I'm a big fan of this. So I have one kilometer. Maybe I don't know how many kilometers are in millimeter, but I do know how many meters are in a kilometer. I know there are a thousand meters. One thousand meters in one kilometer. So 
So I've just converted it by doing this factor label method. I've converted into meters. And then I also know that there are 1,000 millimeters. in one meter. So I can convert by doing this multiplication problem now. I can see that the kilometers on the top of the beginning are going to cancel with the kilometers that are in the bottom of this second conversion factor fraction that I've kind of written. And that converts my kilometers into meters. And then I need to cancel out those meters so I can cancel out the meters uh, by using this third conversion factor that converts me from millimeters into the uh, from meters into millimeters. I can just plug this into my calculator so I do 1 times 1000 times 1000 and I get 1 times 10 to the 6 millimeters. And I can use a shorthand for scientific notation. I can do 1 e6 which represents 1 times 10 to the 6 in millimeters. And there is my final answer for doing a simple, simple conversion. So let's see a slightly more complicated conversion. Perhaps I want to know how many meters per second are in 15 miles per hour. So I want to do 15 miles per hour and convert that into meters over seconds. So how can I do this? Well, I know 15 miles per hour can be written as miles divided by hours. So I can start changing units over. First, I want to change my meters into miles or my hours into seconds. I'm just going to do meters to, uh, miles to meters. I can look up this conversion factor in a book. There is one mile is equivalent to 1609 meters. So that is a conversion factor that we could look up in a table inside of a book. So I can see that I'm canceling out my miles and I'm gonna be left with meters up top. Now I wanna get rid of my seconds, uh, get rid of my hours, turn those into seconds. So I know I want one hour up top to cancel out. I don't know how many hours are in, uh, how many seconds are in an hour off the top of my head, but I do know there are 60 minutes in an hour. So I can convert that one hour into 60 minutes. Notice, any conversion factor that you use, you have the equivalent value up top as you do down bottom. The numbers are different. So these numbers, one hour, one, is not the same as 60. But they become the same because of the units that you associate them with. One hour is the same as 60 minutes. Okay, so all these conversion factors are basically one. Uh, these fractions are one uh, uh, in, in a sense. So then we want to convert minutes into seconds. So I can do one minute up top, and I know that on the bottom I have 60 seconds because there are 60 seconds in a minute. And I can look at my factor label and look at make sure everything's canceling out that I think should be. First, my miles up top cancel with these miles down here, and I'm left with my meters. Which I want, I want meters up top. And I have my hours on the bottom. My hours on the bottom there cancel with my hours up top there, and they become minutes. And I want to convert those minutes into seconds. So my minutes on the bottom here cancel with the minutes on the top here, and I'm left with just seconds. So now I have meters divided by seconds for my final units. And again, this is dimensional analysis. It's a super valuable skill that you will need to get familiar with, and you will use a ton in physics. So I can multiply these numbers together. I can take out my calculator 15 times 1,609 divided by 60 divided by 60. And when you plug and chug all this in, you will find that 15 miles per hour is 6.7 meters divided by seconds. And you've just done dimensional analysis. Some other concepts we want to be familiar with in physics are going to be the concepts of accuracy, precision, and how those relate to something called significant figures. And we have two definitions. We want to know accuracy, which is how close you are to an actual value, an actual measurement. And we can quantify this using something called a percent error or a percent difference. So the percent error is a calculation you can make. 
a percent error is equal to the absolute value of some observation that you make minus some accepted value. So you observe or measure something that you know should be a certain number and subtract the observation from the accepted value and divide by the accepted value then multiply what by 100 and this gives you kind of a measure how of how statistically close you are to an accepted value so how good your experiment is and you practice with uh, accuracy and percent errors really uh, predominantly in kind of a laboratory setting we also have something called precision which is related to accuracy it's actually how close you are to all your other measurements so in a lab, you typically want to do a lot of measurements. Rough uh, approximation, you want to do your experiment and make measurements at least kind of, kind of five times would be a bare minimum kind of rule of thumb. So you want to take a look at those five measurements and you want to see how close they are to each other. Okay. So that's one way you can think of precision. Or you can think of it as how small the markings are on your measuring tool. So if I have a ruler that's in inches, those are going to be broader markings than if I have a ruler that's in something like centimeters. So precision can be how close you are to all your other measurements, or it can be how small the markings are on your measuring tool. So what's your scale like? Now we can see another example of this in the form of a dartboard. So let's say I have a dartboard, and I'm just going to start throwing darts at this board. I throw my first dart, and it lands right over here. I throw my second dart, and it lands right over here. I throw my third dart, and all my darts keep landing in kind of the same place. And I can describe these dart measures, these darts, in terms of accuracy and precision. Now in darts, the goal is really to hit this bullseye. You want to hit the middle. So the darts that I've thrown are all offset from that, so that means that my shots are not very accurate. All of these darts are inaccurate measurements. However, just because they're inaccurate, that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with my experiment. Because these inaccuracies, they're all kind of in the same location on the dartboard. So even though I'm inaccurate, my dart throwing is very precise. Notice how all the darts I've thrown are in the same location. So maybe I can look at my experiment and realize something that I'm measuring wrong. Maybe if I think to myself, I can step over uh, a little bit, take a couple steps to the side, and then I start throwing darts again. So I move my measurement tool, I move where I'm actually throwing from, and I start throwing darts. And now my darts, maybe I shifted something, I'm sitting in a chair now, so my dart throws are lower, and I've shifted over to kind of, kind of the right a little bit. And I start throwing my darts, and we notice there again, I'm a very precise dart thrower, thrower. And by adjusting my tools, by adjusting how I'm throwing these darts, I've then increased my accuracy. So here, by changing where I was uh, starting off from throwing darts, maybe I moved over to the side a little bit and sat down. I went from being just precise to being both precise and accurate. And this is going to be a goal in kind of physics, in doing physics experiments. You want to get precise measurements so that you know you're confident that your measurements are all good and that your method of measuring is good. And you also want to shoot for accuracy so that you know that your measurements are actually right. So we combine these two to kind of get good measurements in physics. And the last thing we want to do is, is kind of quantify this, put this into a number format. So if we want to quantify our measurements, we, we want to use this concept of sig figs. Sig figs tell you how many digits in your measurements are actually reliable. So how accurate are your measurements? How many decimal places are actually useful in these measurements that you make? So you can read about sig figs in any kind of textbook that you want, and there are some rules that govern how you work with sig figs. 
if I'm doing addition or subtraction. So let's say I'm going to take the number 7.564. Maybe this is some kind of measurement, uh, some length that I've measured in meters. And I'm going to add the measurement of 6.05 that I measured also in meters. If I add these two numbers together, I'm going to get 13.614. Okay, so we can do this in a calculator. You would add up and get 13.614. But when I'm adding numbers, and when I'm particular adding measurements, I can't be any more precise than my least precise measurement. So my least precise measurement is this 6.05 right here. It's only accurate. It's only precise out to the hundredths place. So my final measurement can't be more accurate than that hundredths place. So I have to round. So my final measurement, after I add these two measurements together, would equate out to 13.61. So in addition and subtraction, you can only use, if you're adding or subtracting, the least accurate decimal. And then there's one other way that you can actually combine measurements. For some reason, you might need to actually multiply or divide measurements. There's a new rule that governs how you do that. So if I want to do multiplication or division, let's say I have a measurement of 5.2 times a measurement of 6.38 times a measurement of 1. I can multiply all these numbers together. I get a number 33.176. Now in this case, I can have no more sig figs than the least precise number. If I look at all these measurements, I can count the number of sig figs. Again, go to any textbook to figure out how to figure out if a number is significant. I have two sig figs here, I have three sig figs here, and I have one sig fig significant figure here. So this means my answer can only have the least uh, number of sig figs, uh, of the least precise number. So here we have one significant figure. So when I do this multiplication, I'd be tempted to round this to 33. Okay, So that's one way we could do it, and some explanations of sig figs will go with that. So that's the least precise value, because it has the least um, decimal places. So 33 would be an acceptable answer. Or some rules for sig figs would suggest that you take it a step farther. And since you only have one sig fig, you need one sig fig in your answer. Here I have two, because there are two actual digits. So I might have to round this to the number 30. I've seen it explained both ways depending on the book that you use. So we need to be aware of this. We can use two sig figs, or we could use one sig fig. Uh, for my purposes, either one would be an acceptable answer. And to make life even easier, unless asked otherwise, I would ask that typically, and I would suggest that this is, this is pretty true uh, in most places, you want to use three sig figs, three significant figures in any problem or answer that you give. Should be sufficient for anybody's purposes.